heavy and thundery. But the rain across the very far north of Scotland, especially for Shetland, really just staying there all day. For many, a slightly cooler day than today, but still not doing too badly for the time of year. Looking ahead to New Year's Day, for many northern areas, it's a mixture of some bright spells, but a scattering of showers once again. Further south, a much drier and brighter day. A, a brief respite in the weather before, unfortunately, further rain comes in later on in the day. And that sets us up for a fairly unsettled few days as we start 2024. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories. Which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper. We've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens with our team of dedicated journalists across the UK. We're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. GB News is Britain's news channel, and now you can support it. All you have to do is scan that QR code that's up on your screen right now, or you can go to gbnews.com forward slash support and become a GB News member. You'll have fantastic benefits. We're also going to organise special events where you as GB News members can meet the presenters, the on-screen faces, scan the QR code or go to gbnews.com slash support. Thank you so much. Yes, all day. The big night is tonight, but I'm with you for the next two hours this morning, Sunday with Richard Tice. And we're going to be keeping company on TV online, of course, and on digital radio. Loads of big stories. First of all, after the news will be my Sunday sermon when I'm talking about the extraordinary, shocking scenes in Camberwell, central London, 
yesterday afternoon. Also, we're going to be talking about the latest travel and train disruptions. It's unbelievable. Wherever you're trying to go, frankly, it's a nightmare. You're almost better to stay at home. And then, obviously, we've got to look at also an international story. What is going on in India? It's moving away from being the biggest world's democracy to being incredibly authoritarian. You will be truly shocked. Fireworks, the first ones for the new year from New Zealand at around 11 o'clock. All of these things uh, to look forward to and then a big, big second hour as well. And uh, obviously we've got the New Year's, New Year's Eve tonight. I want your resolutions. What are they? Saving cash, spending more, saving, saving weight, losing weight. Any new hobbies or, frankly, just have the resolution not to have any more New Year's resolutions. Whatever it is, get in touch with us, GB News at gbviews.com or send us a message on the socials at GB News. But first of all, it's the news, of course, with Tatiana Sanchez. Richard, thank you very much and good morning. This is the latest from the GB Newsroom. Look forward to 2024 with pride and optimism. That's the message from the Prime Minister as Britain prepares to celebrate the new year. Rishi Sunak promised a brighter future in his New Year's message with tax cuts and a reduction in national insurance. He described 2023 as a momentous year, which saw inflation halved and record investment in the NHS. That's despite junior doctors in England planning their longest walkout in NHS history next month. The Prime Minister says his New Year's resolution is to keep driving forward. Inflation is set to fall further, cutting the cost of living for everyone. And we're not stopping there. We're going further to grow our economy by reducing debt, cutting taxes and rewarding hard work, building secure supplies of energy here at home, backing British business and delivering world-class education. Meanwhile, the Labour leader says the power to shape the future of Britain's rests in everyone's hands. Sir Keir Starmer's message offered a preview of his party's election campaign, saying 2024 needs to give Britain its future back. In the Labour Party, we've been building to this for four years. We're confident we have a plan that can move our country forward, end the cost of living crisis, take back our streets, get the NHS back on its feet, cheaper energy bills for your home, more opportunities for your children. Boris Johnson's former chief advisor says Rishi Sunak tried to strike what he called a secret deal in a bid to win the next election. Dominic Cummings told the Sunday Times he was prepared to help the Tories win if he was assured the most critical issues were prioritised. That reportedly includes nuclear weapons infrastructure, future pandemics and artificial intelligence. The proposal was apparently rejected by the Prime Minister. Number 10 did not deny the report, but says Mr Cummings was not offered a position. American XL Billy Dogs must be kept on a lead in England and Wales under new rules coming into force today. They'll need to be muzzled in public and it's illegal to breed, sell or abandon them. Owners are urged to apply for a certificate of exemption for current pets by the end of January before it becomes illegal to keep any unapproved XL bully dog. The ban follows a series of deadly attacks this year. And finally, Eurostar services are back in service today, but the company's warning of further delays and busy stations. All Eurostar services between London and St Pancras came to a halt yesterday as water flooded a tunnel beneath the Thames. Many passengers were left facing expensive hotel bills as others desperately searched for alternative travel routes. Eurostar says at least one tunnel can now be used, but there are speed restric restrictions in place and stations are expected to be very busy. Southeastern and Thameslink rail services are also expecting delays. This is GB News across the UK on TV, in your car, on your digital radio and on your smart speaker by saying play GB News. Now back to Richard. Tatiana, thank you very much indeed. And a very warm welcome to all of you this New Year's Eve. It's just after 10 o'clock. You may have a busy day planned ahead before some, hopefully some celebrations this evening. And you've heard from the Prime Minister and the head of the Labour Party, Sir Keir Starmer, talking about optimism. How optimistic are you feeling? I want to hear from you, of course. What are your New Year's 
resolutions. Are you optimistic? In a way, we always want to be, surely. But in reality, when you look at the cold, hard facts of what is going on, we'll be looking through this two-hour show at some of the future prospects on the economy, on migration, and frankly, on law and order. And on Sundays, when I'm doing a show, I like to do a, a sermon, what I optimistically call, there's the optimism, Britain's favourite Sunday sermon. So my Sunday sermon today, I have to say, is concerning. Because yesterday, in central London, Camberwell, just about a mile and a half from Westminster, there were some truly, truly shocking scenes. Now, just first of all, we'll show you a couple of clips that have been out on social media. You may have seen, you may not. Just take a look at these before I discuss my thoughts and get your thoughts later in the show. Take a look at them. <laughs> So I just was silent there. I wanted those who are watching just to see that. But obviously, some of you are listening on your radio. And to explain there, there were two clips of people with sticks, with poles, attacking police, who simply didn't have any form of defence. They didn't have helmets. They didn't have riot gear. Huge, long poles and sticks. And they were attacking police vans. You heard the sirens. It was a truly terrifying scene. And that was in central London. And what on earth, how have we, what's going on? How have we ended up in this situation? There were probably up to 100 people, apparently mainly concerning an issue that's going on, concerns tension in Eritrea, in Africa, a long way away. And you might think, what is going on? Now, the footage whilst I'm speaking is of the riot police finally arriving at the scene with their shields, with their helmets, with all the gear. Not before time, because the police officers originally, men and women on the front line, frankly, I suspect, would have been terrified, overwhelmed and, frankly, under-resourced, under-armed, faced with those long poles, those sticks and some very aggressive language and attacks from those people. Now, we've talked about it before, multiculturalism, and some people from the left say it's a great thing. Well, let's just look at the history, shall we, in the last couple of years. 2021, a teacher in Batley forced into hiding, where he's still in hiding two years later, because of extreme Islamist ideology. And then last year, in the beginning of September last year, 2022, we had the riots in Leicester between tensions between Hindus and Muslims that went on for some three weeks, barely reported in the press until it became too big to ignore. Apparently about the state of cricket matches between India and Pakistan, thousands of miles away. In the last few months, we've had the pro-Palestine, Hamas-supporting marches across the United Kingdom. I called it out. They were inciting anti-Semitism, hatred and violence. But the police let them go ahead, the Prime Minister let them go ahead, and they created a scene of growing anti-Semitism. This is not a positive development. There's no optimism in this Prime Minister. This is absolute failure. 
This is weakness. This is woeful. And it's completely unacceptable. And these scenes we saw yesterday, this is the result of a vacuum of leadership. This is the result where if people don't fear the consequences, if they don't think there's any form of deterrent, then they will just take the law into their own hands. And what we are seeing, I'm afraid to say, is the consequences of mass uncontrolled immigration from people from all over the world who do not understand our culture, they don't empathize with our values, they're frankly not interested and don't support our history and our heritage. They're focused on their own culture. And frankly, they're quite happy just to use and abuse our generosity, our hospitality, our tolerance, and our system of law and order. We don't do riots in this country. We don't do sticks and poles. We do do lawful, legal protest. And what happened yesterday was nothing of the sort. Absolutely nothing of the sort. Our police completely inadequately protected. Where was the leadership from the bosses of the police, frontline officers there, to protect them? Get your helmets on, get the shields out. None at all. How can you expect young men and women to want to go into the police force? I've got a close relative of mine thinking of going into the Met Police. When you look at what happened yesterday in central London, that lack of protection, and one of the reasons they're terrified is because they're not sure their bosses will look after them if it comes to it. You see, the police are very happy to take on white-skinned football thugs breaking the law. They'll go in hard on them, but they're terrified if there's rioting, bad behaviour by people of any other skin colour. They're terrified they'll be accused of racism in the police. And that actually leaves them exposed. And I have to ask the question of the leadership of the police. Seriously, are our police, are they safe in that environment? Why did you let them be so exposed? In particular, young female police officers on the front line, possibly not that tall. Have they really got the strength to deal with those sticks, those poles, that level of violence? I have to say, I'm not so sure. I'm asking the question. Some might say I'm being sexist. I'm just trying to be a realist in this situation. It is completely unacceptable what happened yesterday and nothing in the mainstream media on it. You've got to go a long way through the newspapers to get that. No reporting of those videos on the mainstream media. Why? Because it doesn't fit the narrative. It's embarrassing. It's politically incorrect. Do you see what's happening here? We're not being told the truth. You'll be told the truth here on GB News. You heard it on The Breakfast Show. You're hearing it from me now. I'm telling you what, this is totally and utterly unacceptable. It's appalling. It's the sort of thing, those scenes, you might expect to see in some tin pot town, in some tin pot country, thousands of miles away. We don't do that in the United Kingdom. No, no, no. Totally, totally unacceptable. Now, I suppose I better provide a bit of balance. No doubt some greasy, spotty, vegan, Ofcom watching juvenile is looking to report me to Ofcom for not providing balance. So I'll give you the other side of the story. I'll try and defend it. Silence. I'll tell you why. No, I'll try a bit harder. Maybe those on the left will say, well, the police signed up to it. Maybe they'll say, well, this is an acceptable small price to pay for multiculturalism. Let me tell you, my friends, my listeners, my viewers, there is absolutely nothing acceptable about what went on yesterday. But if we don't address this, if we don't clamp down on it, rock solid, robustly, ruthlessly, and create a proper deterrent, this will get worse. It will get worse and worse because these sorts of people detect weakness. 
If you want to behave like that, there's about 195 other countries you're welcome to go and live in. We don't accept that behaviour here. I don't know who those people were. Maybe some were British-born citizens. But I've got a suspicion, and yes, I'll speculate, that a significant number, probably a majority of them, have arrived here as immigrants, either legally or illegally. But they clearly don't understand how things work here. That is utterly outrageous behaviour. That is not the British culture. We don't want it. And if you want to behave like that, please go and live somewhere else. We don't do breaking the law like that. We do lawful, legal protest. That's what a democracy is about. We don't do rioting. What we do need to do is to defend our brave policemen and women on the front line. And with that, not much optimism in this Sunday sermon, but with that, here endeth my Sunday sermon. Now, after the break, I'm getting to get the views of a top former police officer on what went on yesterday, what we should do about it, how we protect our police forces and how we create a proper deterrent. We've got to talk about this stuff. Don't go anywhere. It's GB News. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper. We've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, we're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests, and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. 
GB News is Britain's news channel, and now you can support it. All you have to do is scan that QR code that's up on your screen right now, or you can go to gbnews.com forward slash support and become a GB News member. You'll have fantastic benefits. We're also going to organise special events where you as GB News members can meet the presenters, the on-screen faces, scan the QR code or go to gbnews.com slash support. Thank you so much. Welcome back, my friends, to me this uh, Sunday morning, New Year's Eve. Now, you've already been on with some great New Year's resolutions. Robert here, this is amazing. My New Year's resolution is to stop using spray deodorants. Deodorant, sorry. Roll on next year. Very good. I like that, Robert. Uh, Lee says, uh, my New Year's resolution is that he's sick to death of the Labour and the Conservatives. Alison says, my resolutions are a dry January, lose some weight, brackets, loads, <laughs> close brackets, proper Conservative government soon, please. Interesting thought there. Um, and as for the speeches from uh, uh, Sunak and Starmer, John says, blah, blah, yawn, yawn. <laughs> they need some new material. There we go. Well, you heard my Sunday sermon there about the riots in Camberwell. I regret to say that four police officers were injured. Uh, I think a number of them hospitalised. Eight people have been arrested after that demonstration. I counted from the videos up to 100 people were there. Well, I'm delighted to be joined down the line by Norman Brennan, a former London police officer and director at the Law and Order Foundation. Norman, a very good morning to you. Although what we saw yesterday was frankly uh, utterly shocking. Uh, I know you've been active on social media with your fury on it. I mean, what's gone on here? How, how have we ended up in this situation where frontline police officers have been left so exposed that I suspect they were terrified with those scenes? Those are four officers yesterday of 40,000 officers that were assaulted in the past year. Frontline police officers are cannon fodder. They've become the Aunt Sally's of society. They have weak leaders. We have a mayor that is completely lost and undermines the Metropolitan Police. We have a government that promise so much and deliver so little. And we have frontline men and women that get up every day against the torrent of abuse on the streets media condemnation and stand between good and bad and right or wrong. They cannot win. And as a result of that, you see police officers almost standing strident, not knowing what to do. Burglary is a priority. So, Robbery is so, a priority. Norman, you talk about leadership and something went badly wrong there where it took what was obviously quite a long period of time before essentially... Uh, the riot squad arrived uh, with the right equipment. And it, it, those, uh, those rioters, they, they felt they had the upper hand. They had the bigger equipment and the police had nothing, just a small truncheon at best. W what, I mean, what should they have? Should we, I mean, one of, my, uh, one of my listeners has said they should be armed with rubber bullets. Uh, Alan says, bring back the water cannon, uh, well, sorry, water cannon, job done. What would you like to see brought back, Norman? Well, let me just clear up a point. You brought in when you first gave your sermon about multi-culture, mass immigration. You're right. Multiculturalism, sadly, is not working in Britain. We have hundreds of thousands of people that come to this country that we welcome. Some, sadly, hate us. And they hate us so much that they take to the streets. They can cause a demonstration, just like they did yesterday, without any prior warning. As a result of that, the immediate units will be sent, will be unarmed officers. Uh, they won't be public order officers. They would just be the frontline response officers. And as you highlighted, and I saw, and everyone else saw, there were countless dozens of young people, men, armed. So those officers could only do so much. You cannot take on a hundred plus violent, angry men. And as a result of that, the Commissioner's Reserve, which are the TSG officers, would have been alerted immediately. And it sometimes can take 10 or 15 minutes for them to arrive. 
Now the but, thing is here, Richard. This bit, let me t let me tell you the let me tell you the crux. If any of those officers got out their baton and charged at any of them uh, suspects, armed suspects, and God forbid they intended to strike their arm or across the chest or leg, and inadvertently they struck them across the head, the following morning the media and these groups that hate us so much and all these other mandy pandy judges and everyone else that brings this country to its knees with their silly decisions will demand that officer is suspended that officer will be suspended so, so that's, 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 that, that's that's the leadership point norman but we've got to have this debate and rapidly and our current leadership need to make some changes because otherwise uh, a police officer is going to be either very badly hurt or far, far worse. I, I talked last Thursday night about my fear about the safety of politicians, but I also fear now about the safety of our police. I mean, should actually they all have, for example, tasers? There has to be a proper deterrent so that those who are going to riot know that the consequences will be severe and bluntly, it may hurt. I'll tell you what we need, Richard. In London, we need three water cannons with dye. And anybody that's acting unlawfully, has weapons, assaults the police, damages our state property, they are hit with this die. And those water cannons will have cameras that can facial recognise. And anyone with that die leaving the area will be arrested. We also need eight sets of 250 police officers, 10 with dogs, 10 armed officers, Every single one of those 250 officers are fully public order trained. There will be eight of those units going around Britain. One will be in London. They can join up together as and when they need to. And they will challenge and tackle every area in Britain where thugs and criminals and the violent people that think that they can walk the streets unopposed will be challenged. The sad reality is, Richard, it won't happen because everybody has become a police, a, a social worker. Yeah. Chiefs of police, where are they? They should be on the programme this morning, defending their officers. But, but, they're weak, they're woke, they're lost, they've got no vision, and where are they? Sadly, they're at home, hoping that nobody phones them to make a decision, whilst Norman, frontline I'm, men and women, as you rightly say, risk their lives day in and day out. Norman, I'm, I'm with your fury, I'm with your anger, and I know that millions of people at home Hearing this, watching this, will be absolutely furious as well. Norman, I think you speak for millions. Thank you so much indeed for joining me this morning. Uh, sadly, when we speak to someone like Norma Brennan, it's almost always bad news. I'm delighted to be joined throughout the show by the former Labour MP, Simon Danzuk, in the studio. Simon, uh, great to see you, but a pretty tough start to the show. Not great optimism for the news. Eve. When you see that going on, you heard Norman there, you've seen the the clips. Um, it does feel to me there's a serious leadership issue here, Simon, at many levels, uh, the, 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 the police bosses of the units, uh, the head of the Met, the mayor, right up to the Home Secretary. Doesn't seem to be any noise from them whatsoever this morning. And and no deterrent whatsoever. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And the bigger picture is that we've imported uh, the situation. We've imported other countries' problems into our country. We've uh, imported a total disrespect for our uh, uniformed personnel. And we've Im imported hate into our country. And that's primarily been through allowing illegal immigration. And we've seen that play out on our streets. And we really need to police this in a different way. We need to start taking much stronger action. And it's ironic because Starmer, Keir Starmer, in his, uh, in his New Year's uh, speech, he says, we have a plan to take back our streets. He'll, he, he will be completely silent on this issue. Yes. Uh, Sadiq Khan, his mayor in London, is completely silent on this issue because they rely primarily on votes from the uh, from minority communities to be able to get re-elected. And that's why they'll stay silent. And the reality is there won't be any plan uh, to take back our streets uh, in, in, the, in the years to come. But there has to be a deterrent. I think at the moment there has to be a fear and a respect for the police 
and the consequences of what might happen. Norman put forward a couple of suggestions. Frankly, I would have all of the police, every single officer, I would have them trained with tasers, I would have them carrying tasers, because that is an instant way of protecting themselves. Um, it's a short, sharp shot to the, uh, the person that's assailing them. Um, and I like the idea of some die-in-the-water cannon. But I would say, look, if it's a British-born citizen uh, who's, who's there, uh, doing the rioting, well, then we've got the, uh, the, the, the law to, to properly deal with them and, frankly, to lock them up. But if these people are immigrants who've got a permanent right to stay or a visa to stay, that should be revoked. In my view, they should be deported forthwith and, uh, and never to return. That way, you've got a double deterrent. Absolutely. And, and there's two important points there. Norman is exactly right. It's about weak leadership from uh, the top of the police in terms of how you police these issues. And then your point in terms of uh, deporting these people. I used to be the MP for Rochdale. It took us years to get uh, some of the uh, Rochdale grooming gang deported from the UK. And it shouldn't take that long. And that's a perfect example. These people, many will have dual nationality, should be deported if they're identified in that video. Simple. Unbelievable, Simon. We'll be coming back to that. Some migration stories later. Thank you very much indeed from Simon indeed. Well, a pretty tough start to the show. Lots more coming up. We're going to be talking about travel. You are, of course, watching and listening to GB News. I'm Richard Tice, and we've got the news with Tatiana Sanchez, first of all. Richard, thank you. It's 10.31. This is the latest. Look forward to 2024 with pride and optimism. That's the message from the Prime Minister as Britain prepares to celebrate the new year. Rishi Sunak promised a brighter future in his New Year's message with tax cuts and a reduction in national insurance. He described 2023 as a momentous year, which saw inflation halved and record investment in the NHS. That's despite junior doctors in England planning their longest walkout in NHS history next month. Boris Johnson's former chief adviser says Rishi Sunak tried to strike what he called a secret deal in a bid to win the next election. Dominic Cummings told the Sunday Times that he was prepared to help the Tories if he was assured the most critical issues were prioritised. That reportedly includes nuclear weapons infrastructure, future pandemics and artificial intelligence. The proposal was apparently rejected by the Prime Minister. Number 10 did not deny the report, but says Mr Cummings was not offered a position. American XL bully dogs must be kept on a lead in England and Wales under new rules coming into force today. They'll need to be muzzled in public and it's illegal to breed, sell or abandon them. Owners are urged to apply for a certificate of exemption for current pets by the end of January before it becomes illegal to keep any unapproved XL bully dog. The ban follows a series of deadly attacks this year. And Eurostar services are back in service today, but the company is warning of further delays as and busy stations. All Eurostar services between London and Paris came to a halt yesterday as water flooded a tunnel beneath the River Thames. Many passengers were left facing expensive hotel bills as others desperately searched for alternative travel routes. Eurostar says at least one tunnel can now be used, but there are speed restrictions in place and stations are expected to be very busy. For more on all of those stories, you can visit our website, gbnews.com. Thank you very much, Tatiana. Well, loads more coming up on today's show. It's a stormy, stormy end to 2023. We've got Euro serv Eurostar services halted yesterday. Lots more. We'll keep you abreast of that and uh, other New Year's Eve travel plans and disruption. But first of all, let's take a look at the weather with Craig Snell. Good morning. Welcome to your latest GB News weather forecast. I'm Craig Snell. Well, as we go through New Year's Eve, for most of us, it's going to be a mixture of bright spells and scattered showers. So it's not quite the case for the far north of Scotland here. It's actually going to be quite a wet and windy end to 2023. But uh, elsewhere, there will be some sunshine, as I mentioned, but also a scattering of showers initially across the west, but they will spread their way eastwards as we go through the course of the day. Some of these will be quite heavy. Could even hear the odd rumble of thunder. Quite blustery too across the the south coast and with winds coming in from the northwest a little bit of a cooler day compared to yesterday but temperatures still doing fairly reasonably could see highs reaching about 9 to 10 degrees across the south. 
then as we head towards midnight, for most of us, it's going to continue with a risk of some showers, so have a rain jacket handy. For Scotland, it might well turn a little bit dry here as we go past midnight, but that may allow it to turn fairly chilly. Elsewhere, temperatures not falling much lower than about 5 to 7 degrees in the southern half of the UK. So for New Year's Day itself, for the northern half of the UK, we continued that showery theme, a mixture of some bright spells and some showers. But for the southern half, actually, it will turn drier and brighter for a time. So a brief respite from the unsettled weather here. But uh, it's not going to last for too long, especially down towards the very far southwest of the UK. Some cloud and some rain will return later on in the day. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. Wake up to the headlines with Headliners every morning at 5 a.m. We treat you to the day's biggest stories before anyone else, seven days a week. You can catch up on everything you need to know before you've even had your kippers. Mmm. Headliners every morning at 5 a.m. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. Mental? Open your mouth. OK, here comes, a, <laughs> here comes a train. Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? Oh, whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. Have a great Saturday night with me, Leo Curse, on this Saturday night showdown. It's a crazy world out there, so come and make fun of it with me, my panel of comedians, and a couple of people who actually know what they're talking about. This Saturday night showdown is your front row ticket to the clown show. Every Saturday, only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello and welcome back to GB News with me, Richard Tice, until 12 o'clock. So in the next hour, we've got officials warning of a next year of a record number of channel migrant crossings. You might think, how could we have any more? But that's the warning because of what's happening across the Mediterranean. And then also, we're going to be looking at the economic prospects for 2024. No recession so far, but I have to say, it's pretty close, folks. And EU regulations, I can't bear the wretched things. I want to get rid of thousands of them, not just a few hundred. We'll be debating all of that. 
But first of all, something really shocking is going on in the biggest democracy in the world, our Commonwealth partner nation of India. They go to the polls this spring in 2024 in the whole sort of global Super Bowl of election. India is the world's largest election. You've got more than 900 million people registered to vote in India. Really, really significant. But some shocking things and recent developments in India's democracy are beginning to worry many, many people. I'm delighted to be joined now in the studio by the Chief Operating Officer of Conservative Friends of the Commonwealth, Sunil Sharma. I've still got Simon Danzuk in the studio. Sunil, welcome to GB News this morning. Look, um, India, the biggest democracy, uh, potentially uh, negotiating a big trade deal with our Prime Minister, who obviously got very significant Indian ties. And many people, people, I think, that's all great, isn't it? Wonderful. We should be celebrating all of that. But we've got the Indian Foreign Minister over the Christmas period in Moscow, standing alongside Sergei Lavrov, announcing unbelievably, given what Russia's doing in Ukraine, a new joint project for weapons deals. I mean, this feels to me like a complete slap in the face to the West. I think the, the big problem with India and the coverage, especially whether it's The Telegraph, Guardian, BBC on India, is a lack of understanding on India's ind uh, independence since they've become independent. In India's constitution, they're a country that is founded on socialism. That is India's uh, uh, bread and butter. That's what they've been founded on. During the 1960s and 70s, the West pretty much abandoned India, had played a much stronger role with its neighbours in, in Pakistan. And India were almost forced to be in a very close relationship with the USSR, the Soviet Union, Russia. If you look to, the, to this day, 60% of all military comes from USSR, Russia. And so they have a very, on a pragmatic level, they have to keep a relationship with Russia, whether they like it or not. The majority of the military comes from that country. So on a pure pragmatic basis, the West has not been supportive of India in, when it comes to this military sort of stuff. So naturally, they're going to go to a partner that has been relatively reliable for them in their historic references. What was really good with the previous, uh, our previous Prime Minister in Boris Johnson and Donald Trump in America, when they did make the visit to India, when they did talk about a collective, uh, three countries coming together, when they wanted India to distance themselves from Russia and them to work closer together, that was a great start in, in India becoming closer to the West, especially when you look at the shared history and the shared values. But you've, you, but you've also got uh, the... Um, you've got... Uh essentially the Prime Minister Narendra Modi, he's... I mean, there have been serious concerns about attack on Sikhs in Canada, here in the UK, that are actually directly linked back to the Indian government. And you've got, just in the last week, barely reported here in the UK, over 140 opposition MPs thrown out of their, their parliament whilst uh, important draconian laws were being passed by the government. I mean, this... This is a country that's moving from a democracy to, to some form of, of quasi-authoritarian dictatorship. No, I think, that, I think the, big, the big problem with, like I said, when you're moving from transitioning from socialism to now you have a leader who is overtly capitalistic, is very pro-big business, has taken away power from government and given it back to people, what you're seeing now is a massive pushback from lots of people that are just refusing to accept the new India, the new version of India, this more capitalistic pro-business India. And what we're seeing, especially with the coverage on mainstream media, is India are an example of when socialism goes bad, and they have been for the last 40 years. What the new leader has done with the BJP is, last 10 years, they've become so pro-capitalistic. They've taken away the, the emphasis on diversity and inclusion. They've taken away the fact that there is a majority faith and that this should be the faith that people should not be uh, allowed to abuse as much but as they But those are libertarian been. issues. There's in a sense, they have nothing to do with capitalism, as far as I can. Well, see. libertarian, I mean, and, but economically, he's done two massive things. So both economically and socially, he's gone to a much more Western way of thinking, if you like. Now, the coverage that he will get in this country, especially when it's with our, our media, which is so left-leaning, indoctrinated, that they will look at this as an example of how do you almost counter a group of people that are actually doing relatively successful? So yeah, I mean, it's, it's a high-growth economy. I mean, look, you can look at the UAE, yeah. and in a sense, that's a benign, successful, high-growing dictatorship. Yeah. Um, but, but 
India is understood to be a, 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 the world's biggest democracy. It's got important elections. But some of these things, you can't ban a whole load of opposition you, MPs you can't, you can't and, ban, and claim you you're, ban, you're still a, you, you a, a workable ban, liberal no, democracy. You shouldn't ban uh, MPs uh, for having different views. But you should ban people or MPs who say very things are threatening to India. The same, you know, I know in this country we've gone away from having any sort of being proud of British values, being proud of the fact of how great our country is. We have an example of somebody who I think we should actually be in the West actually be proud of in the sense of somebody who is not bowing down to this left indoctrination across the globe, somebody who is very prone his conservative values. And unfortunately, the Western media has decided for, for whatever reason, to make this about um, the uh, dictatorial authoritarian style, because that's not the reality. Somebody, I know we don't do anything when people in this country go after uh, the fact that we are a largely a, a country based on Judeo-Christian values. We just allow people to absolutely decimate it and we have no problem with doing that. We shouldn't, in my opinion, be doing that. And finally, we have a leader across the globe who's saying, no, I'm not going to put up with that. You cannot come to India, say bad things about India, to say that you're going to attack... These are, these, are, these are elected MPs who've been banned from Parliament whilst you've got laws. You've got the other issue here, which is that they're now the biggest importer of seaborne oil from Russia, completely in breach of all of the sanctions against Russia because of Ukraine. And so three years ago, they were importing almost no oil from Russia. They've used this as a beneficial financial opportunity to buy cheap, dirty oil from Russia, sometimes which they're then selling into the West. Now, you, you could say that's good business, but it's hardly endearing themselves to the West at a time when they're desperately trying to do a trade deal with us. They want more freedom of movement between India and the UK. And it feels to me we've got a serious wake-up call that we need to uh, face into I, in the UK. I think the wake-up call we need to look at is the reality of India is their own country. They have different, different, they're in a different subsector to us in the sense of the harsh reality is the India-Russia relationship goes a lot deeper and they've been a much reliable partner than the West. What we should be doing, because we have shared history, we, we have shared democratic values, we should be trying to integrate this country as mu much as possible. We should be telling them there are alternative solutions. This is a country that is the fifth or sixth largest economy in the world. Yeah. We're seeing Apple moving their products away from China into India. We should be looking, that, looking at them as an opportunity to decouple away from China and be bringing them in. We cannot enforce our British values or what we're doing here. No. No, but, what, what, but we, what we should be doing when we go into these sort of trade deals, and I get the whole point about trying to sort of bring them closer to us, more away from Russia, is we've got to do it with our eyes open. Yeah, for we sure. can't be naive about this. And we can't just say they're the world's greatest, uh, biggest democracy making great progress when actually they're becoming more authoritarian. If we go into it with our eyes open, fair enough. We do lots of, of uh, trade. Uh, and growing, increasing trade with dictatorships in the Middle East, for example. And we just go into it with our eyes open, yeah. except different countries have different values. I just think it's there's a serious gap in awareness at the I, moment, I, which I, needs to be uh, needs I, to be. I, I think personally that we're being really pushed this agenda of authoritarianism. The, the, the most popular leader across the world is Narendra Modi. That is a fact. You look at all polling, he comes out as number one. So if the Indian people in India are saying this is the most popular leader, that the, 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 the BJP keep winning elections, these riots that people talk about in India, when we say a million, it sounds a lot, but when it's a country of a billion, that's, yeah, bad, that's not a percent. I know, so, I know. So, so the, the, but for us in the West, I think what we should be, we're, we're obsessed with talking about India and, you know, they're right to talk about concerns and issues with the we will not talk about issues with its neighbours on, on either side. We will blank that we will never talk about those, but we will concentrate on the fact that India has such an authoritarian leader where there are actually more Muslims in India than there are Muslims in Pakistan. So if he's such an authoritarian leader and he's so pro-Hindu nationalist and all this sort of stuff, why is it that you have 79% of the population in that country is Hindu, and um, more than 14%. I, yeah. so. I, I, I get all that. I guess the fact is what you've highlighted is that, in a sense, they have got very different values to that. And we've yeah. talked earlier in the show about the impact of different cultures, different values. And we have to be aware that part of those values are very strong links to Russia. And we've just got to go into this with our eyes open. Um, Sunil Sharma, thank you so much for those thoughts. It's going to be a fascinating year. You're obviously predicting that the BJP is going to win by a landslide, you think, next oh, year sure. in these I elections? Think that, yeah, definitely. They're, they've got such a big... They're winning seats where they've never won before. And I think that will continue. I think for them, they yeah. do need to think about succession planning post Narendra Modi. Fascinating. Well.
and we'll come back to that. Sunil Sharma, uh, the Chief Operating Officer of Conservative Friends of the Commonwealth, thank you so much for being with us here on GB News. Now, travel, storms, it's all happening. Eurostar yesterday cancelling its service in a flooded tunnel near Kent. But fear not, good news. They've resumed their services today, although we've got speed restrictions. Well, at least they're moving. I mean, we never really expect much speed on our trains, do we? But let's have a look at what's the impact of all of this disruption on our travel plans. I'm delighted to be joined by the travel editor of The Sun, who knows it all, Lisa Minow, is down the line. Good morning to you, Lisa. Thanks for being with us. So what do people need to be aware of as they head towards the New Year's Eve plans? Where's the biggest risks? Well, I mean, I think it's still going to be those same routes that we've seen problems throughout the holiday season. Today, particularly, I think there's going to be issues because not only is it New Year's Eve, but it's a Sunday. And that has led to staff shortages at some of the railway companies across the UK. Northern, they've actually said that do not travel at all on routes out of Manchester Piccadilly and Manchester um, Victoria to Chester Stabr and Staybridge. Plus, there's also no routes uh, or no trains on routes from Preston to Colne and Bolton to Morecambe. Now, that's quite a significant section of the northwest of the country. And then down here in London, um, Thameslink also has Thames, um, serious shortages. So that's the trains that run between Bedford and Brighton and Gatwick. So anyone planning on travelling with either Northern or, or Thameslink should be checking to make sure there's any trains before attempting to start off a route. We've also got problems for Southeastern as well, as you alluded to earlier. These problems with that tunnel flooding still coming on today. Although we've got one tunnel back open, there are speed restrictions um, and there's a lot of impact on the services for Southeastern that normally go between St Pancras and Ebbsfleet. So that is also going to be something to, to worry about. What's also concerning is the fact that the 30-odd thousand people who didn't manage to get a Eurostar train yesterday, there are no extra services today. What we saw um, about two weeks ago when they had the Eurostar and were impacted by the Eurotunnel Wildcat strike in France, they put on more trains over the coming days to sort of help people get back. Um, I think because of the time of year, because it is a Sunday, because there's no extra trains, a bank holiday, that's just absolutely. So that all sounds a nightmare for today. Uh, presumably, Lisa, also yeah. uh, tomorrow and the beginning of, of the, the, the first week of the new year, uh, not easy either, I guess. No, I mean, I think it's going to be something that's <laughs> we're going to have not the happiest of New Year's if you're trying to get anywhere by train. I think that <laughs> we look at our road network, that's relatively going OK at the moment. The storms in that we've seen over the last couple of days, that does impact travel out of the port of Dover. Although everything seems to be running smoothly at the moment, don't expect an easy ride. There's some really sort of gale force winds in the channel at the moment. Um, and hopefully by the time we run into next week, things will have started to pick up as people go back to work. And just before I let you go, Lisa, what's the latest on the strikes? I mean, I always have to ask because you can't keep up with it. Are we expecting any sort of uh, train or, or bus strikes over the first 10 days or so of the new year? So there is London Underground action between the 2nd and the 9th. Now, that's not a complete shutdown, but there is going to be um, London Underground sort of industrial action over that time. Um, other than that, we haven't had anything else yet come through, but obviously Aslef is still not quite there with all of the train operating companies. So there could still be action into the new year, um, hopefully not as much as we've seen over the previous 12 months. But um, now I think it's going to be the time when people really have to bash heads together and say, come on, we need to get this sorted. It's just gone on for too long. It's gone on way too long. Well, Lisa, thank you so much indeed. Let's hope for some better news in the new year. A very happy new year to you. That's Lisa Minow, travel editor at The Sun with the news there. Frankly, folks, if you're going anywhere, really seriously think about it, because it's not at all easy. Loads and loads to come up in the second hour of the show. We're going to be talking about economic prospects. We're going to be talking about EU red tape. I want to get rid of loads of it. I'm also going to be getting some questions from uh, Simon on the prospects as well. Don't go anywhere, folks. First of all, it's the weather. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Good morning. Welcome to your latest GB News weather forecast. I'm Craig Snell. Well, as we go through New Year's Eve, for most of us, it's going to be a mixture of bright spells and scattered showers. So it's not quite the case for the far north of Scotland here. It's actually going to be quite a wet and windy end to 2023. But uh, elsewhere, there will be some sunshine, as I mentioned, but also a scattering of showers initially across the west, but they will spread their way eastwards as we go through the course of the day. Some of these will be quite heavy. Could even hear the odd rumble of thunder. Quite blustery too across 
the south coast and with winds coming in from the northwest a little bit of a cooler day compared to yesterday but temperatures still doing fairly reasonably could see highs reaching about 9 to 10 degrees across the south. Then as we head towards midnight, for most of us, it's going to continue with a risk of some showers, so have a rain jacket handy. For Scotland, it might well turn a little bit dry here as we go past midnight, but that may allow it to turn fairly chilly. Elsewhere, temperatures not falling much lower than about 5 to 7 degrees in the southern half of the UK. So for New Year's Day itself, for the northern half of the UK, we continued that showery theme, a mixture of some bright spells and some showers. But for the southern half, actually, it will turn drier and brighter for a time. So a brief respite from the unsettled weather here, but uh, it's not going to last for too long, especially down towards the very far southwest of the UK. Some cloud and some rain will return later on in the day. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan, Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks, the admission's free. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens with our team of dedicated journalists across the UK. We're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories. Which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper. We've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Tired of the usual focus-tested, pre-prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's The Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel.
about to go down to New Zealand. Yes, we're in International Channel. We want to catch the new year when it's first up in New Zealand. But loads of you getting in touch with emails and your thoughts on the police attacks. Alan says... Water cannons definitely needed. Public opinion will back this up. Where are the riot police in all of this? I agree, Alan. Kevin says the government's failing in its primary duty to the country to keep our citizens safe. There we are. That's New Zealand. That's the Auckland Sky Tower counting down. Stephen says, what is going on with our police force? People think that they can behave like this without any consequence, any deterrent whatsoever. It's about 42 seconds to go in New Zealand. Glynn, meanwhile, says... The police were quick to use batons when we were protesting about COVID lockdowns. Why are we so weak here? Loads of you, right on it here. Absolutely no question at all. Vicky says, protect our police, give them water cannons. I'm not a violent person, but there's no deterrent whatsoever. Simon Danzuk, just before the 20 seconds, do you yeah, agree? absolutely. I agree with the uh, viewers. I mean, we need to have a stronger police. We need to have a stronger no, sheriff. No. Ten seconds in New Zealand, folks. The Auckland Sky Tower, there it is. Nine, eight, seven. We're right on it. We're 12 hours, 13 hours ahead of ourselves. Three, two, one, boom. There it is. The fireworks are away from the Auckland Sky Tower. It is the new year. 13 hours ahead of us in New Zealand. And they would no doubt be extremely excited. Just listening to that. Some great pictures for those of you listening on the radio. Fireworks going off. The, uh, the Sky Tower in Auckland is kind of changing colour, beautifully lit up, absolutely fantastic. So uh, there we are. That's what's going on in Auckland. New Year's resolutions here also coming in. Lisa and Dave have said, we made a resolution as a couple. We're not going to eat McDonald's at all in 2024. <laughs> <laughs> spend way too much there on drinks and meals. Oh, but not what, I'm not going to give their comment on uh, whether or not it's tasty or not. Meanwhile, David says on uh, the, uh, the speeches for the New Year's speech, of, where's Sunak been living in 2023? He says it's a momentous year, but for hard-working Br Brits, it's actually been disastrous. I think you're right, David. And Starmer boring us with his great lies, according to David. To ensure the keys to number 10, Dave says, lots of Dave's writing in, all I gathered from the speeches was happy same old New Year. Mm, neither can or will change Britain for the better. I'm not sure the optimism of those two leaders is shared by our leaders. Um, Simon, those speeches always sound the same. They always try and be optimistic. But we're going to talk in the second hour. I mean, the prospects economically are challenging to to say the least. Yeah, absolutely. 2023 has been really tough for people and it's going to be tough in 2024 and it's going to be one heck of a fight between Starmer and Sunak. I mean, it, you know, we've been through numerous general elections, but this one is going to be incredibly tough. It'll be interesting to watch, no doubt about it. And, and also, which is actually going to be the most significant? Is it the immigration legal and illegal, yeah. or is it the cost of living, which, the, which yeah. is, is the more significant? What we've seen over recent months is immigration move up the agenda in terms of public's views of what's important to them. Uh, so it's that and the cost of living crisis. They're the two key issues that the general election will be fought on. I think that's right, and I think, to be honest, I think that immigration could well become uh, the biggest one because the impact of population growth mm. on the quality of public services housing rents, yep. house prices, availability of GPs and things is massive. And I think only really recently being understood properly yeah. by people up and down the country. Yeah, absolutely. And I think politicians have been, mainstream politicians have been slow to come to this. They, they, they've been catching up with the public opinion on this. Uh, and and I, th I think there's going to be a shift to the right. People have had enough of illegal immigration. It's going to be a shift to the right over coming months and years, for sure. Well, of course, and we've seen shift to the right in elections across the, the whole of uh, the Eurozone. We've got EU elections next spring, which will also be very interesting to see how that is backed up. We're still watching on the main screen there uh, some of the fireworks celebrations in New Zealand, which, of course, is the, uh, uh, the first country to celebrate the new year, and then that will continue across the world throughout the day. Lots of amazing fireworks. No idea how much uh, money is blown in those fireworks. There'll be a lot blown in, uh, in London later. 
Have you got a New Year's resolution? Oh, my New Year's resolution is always to lose some weight, <laughs> which, I, which I fail with miserably. I, I usually do better in the summer months and then put it all back on in the winter months. So well, I might, one of mine actually is I need to do more exercise. I do a bit, but I need to do more cycling and running. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a pretty tough year for those of us who are in the in the political fight of elections, and one's got to be sharp and, uh, and energetic. You're right, there's a lot of junk food gets eaten during campaigning in elections. I know this from experience. More so fruit I wish you and vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Simon, we'll come back to you. Thank you very much indeed. So, coming up in the second hour of the show, we've got officials warning about record numbers of channel migrants. You can't believe it. Even more, you might say. We also need to look about the economic prospects. Some say it's going to get better. Some say we've done well in 23 to avoid a recession. I'm not so sure. And also, EU laws. I want to scrap thousands of them, not just a few poxy hundred here and there. Please, the government. And obviously, uh, New Year's. I want to hear your resolutions for 2024. Do you want to save some cash, lose some weight, or frankly, just have a holiday and a new hobby. Whatever it is, get in touch, gbviews at gbnews.com. Send us a message on the show's socials. But first of all, it's the news headlines with Tatiana Sanchez. Richard, thank your top stories from the GB newsroom. Look forward to 2024 with pride and optimism. That's the message from the Prime Minister as Britain prepares to celebrate the new year. Rishi Sunak promised a brighter future in his New Year's message with tax cuts and a reduction in national insurance. He described 2023 as a momentous year, which saw inflation halved and record investment in the NHS. That's despite junior doctors in England planning their longest walkout in NHS history next month. The Prime Minister says his New Year's resolution is to keep driving forward. Inflation is set to fall further, cutting the cost of living for everyone. And we're not stopping there. We're going further to grow our economy by reducing debt, cutting taxes and rewarding hard work, building secure supplies of energy here at home, backing British business and delivering world-class education. Meanwhile, the Labour leader says the power to shape the future of Britain rests in everyone's hands. Sir Keir Starmer's message offered a preview of his party's election campaign, saying 2024 needs to give Britain its future back. In the Labour Party, we've been building to this for four years. We're confident we have a plan that can move our country forward, end the cost of living crisis, take back our streets, get the NHS back on its feet, cheaper energy bills for your home, more opportunities for your children. In other news, the US Navy has thwarted an attempt by militants from the Houthi group to board a container ship in the Red Sea. The US says four vessels from Houthi-controlled areas in Yemen fired at the ship and came dangerously close to boarding. In response, helicopters from nearby US warships sunk three of the boats. The Houthis, who are backed by Iran, have stepped up attacks on merchant ships as they travel through one of the world's most important freight routes. The group says the attacks are in response to the conflict in Gaza. Boris Johnson's former chief adviser says Rishi Sunak tried to strike what he called a secret deal in a bid to win the next election. Dominic Cummings told the Sunday Times that he was prepared to help the Tories win if he was assured the most critical issues were prioritised. That reportedly includes nuclear weapons infrastructure, future pandemics and artificial intelligence. The proposal was apparently rejected by the Prime Minister. Number 10 did not deny the report, but says Mr Cummings was not offered a position. American XL Billy Dogs must be kept on a lead in England and Wales under new rules that come into force today. They'll need to be muzzled in public and it's illegal to breed, sell or to abandon them. Owners are urged to apply for a certificate of exemption for current pets by the end of January before it becomes illegal to keep any unapproved XL Billy Dog. The ban follows a series of deadly attacks this year. Eurostar services are back in service today, but the company's warning of further delays and busy stations. All Eurostar services between London and Paris came to a halt yesterday as water flooded a tunnel beneath the River Thames. Many passengers were left facing expensive hotel bills as others desperately searched for alternative travel routes. Eurostar says at least one tunnel can now be used 
but there are speed restrictions in place and stations are expected to be very busy. Southeastern and Thameslink rail services are also expecting delays. The new year has arrived in Auckland as New Zealand's biggest city welcomed 2024 with a spectacular fireworks display. The Sky Tower was alight in sparks and colours as the country became one of the first to chime in 2024. That was beaten by the Pacific nation of Karabati, which entered 2024 at 10 o'clock this morning. And here, New Year's celebrations are to be hit with windy weather conditions this evening. A yellow alert for strong winds is in place until midnight tonight. The strongest of those winds will be felt in the southwest Wales and southwest of England. The Met Office is warning of some delays to road, rail, air and ferry transport, with severe gales expected. Gusts of 55 miles per hour are likely, with the potential for gusts of up to 75 miles per hour for the most exposed coasts and hills. This is GB News across the UK on TV, in your car on digital radio and on your smart speaker by saying play GB News. Now back to Richard. Thank you, Tatiana. Fantastic. Well, there we are into the second hour of this show. So much going on, so much to come. We've got UK officials warning now of a possible record year of Channel Migrant Crossings in 2024. Hang on. I thought the Prime Minister said he was going to stop the boats. I thought the Home Secretary said that he was getting on top of it. The numbers were coming down. Now, apparently, they're going to get worse. Yep, sources have told GB News they're bracing for the arrival of some of the many tens of thousands who've entered Europe illegally in recent months. Let's just see what our Home and Security Editor Mark White has to say in this report. The Prime Minister has pledged to stop the boats and the numbers crossing the Channel this year have reduced. But in truth, every time weather conditions allow, the people smugglers push these small boats into the water. And around 30,000 people still made the crossing this year, only adding to the migrant crisis. In the camps scattered across northern France, thousands are still waiting for their weather window for the chance to reach the UK. And sources have told us they'll be joined by thousands of others in the months ahead some of the huge influx of migrants who crossed into Europe in recent months. I mean, this one's still got its air in it, so it just tells you that this boat ran aground really within recent weeks. But we reported earlier in the year from the Italian island of Lampedusa, where tens of thousands of migrants arrived in boats from North Africa. Italy, Spain, Greece and multiple other European countries all saw massive increases in migrant arrivals this year. Many of those are still working their way north and a significant proportion will try to cross the channel. A key component of the UK government's stop the boat strategy is of course the Rwanda deal. Despite the conveyor belt of legal challenges, the government and many Conservative MPs are convinced that sending asylum seekers to the East African nation will help smash the people smugglers' business model. The people who are dealing with the huge chaos in northern France say that as part of the suite of immigration policies, a deterrent is needed. Why is Austria looking at this? Why is Germany looking at this? Why is the US looking at this? Why is Italy looking at this? Because it is recognised in the world we live in that we have to have a deterrent. Across the European Union, the bloc is still grappling with how best to stem the flow of illegal migrants, with some countries taking markedly different approaches. Analysts believe the human tide of arrivals will only continue to grow. This is simply because Frontex, the organisation that's responsible for patrolling the EU's external borders, doesn't have enough resources, doesn't have enough boats, uh, and there's a lack of coordination between uh, other European countries. Uh, there's an, also an ideological divide within the EU itself. How are you? No one's, no one's up yet. 2024 is a pivotal year for Rishi Sunak. He'll have to go to the country trying to convince the electorate that it's his policies which are key to controlling illegal migration. A quick and positive decision on Rwanda is needed, 
But even then, with thousands of migrants en route to northern France, it's likely border force officials will be busier than ever. Mark White, GB News. That's unbelievable. I mean, truly unbelievable, that report from Mark White. All the government officials, the Prime Minister, the Home Secretary, they're telling us it's getting better. The numbers are 30% down. We're now hearing from their own officials and all the indications that actually it's going to get a lot worse. So let's just remind ourselves that the numbers, 2022, some 45,000 that we know about came across in small boats. Probably 10,000 came across in lorries that we don't really know about. 23, about 30,000. So what you're really saying there, according to Mark White, is we could be up to 40, 45,000 coming across. Where are they going to go? How much is it going to cost? What's going to be the impact on our communities, our villages, our towns, in the hotels? I mean, this is not something to be optimistic about, Prime Minister. You promised you would stop the boats. You've utterly, totally, woefully, hopelessly failed. I'm furious about it. Tens of millions of British people are steaming mad about this. I think immigration, if this carries on, if that report is right, will be the key issue in the election campaign, both illegal and legal. Simon, I'll come to you first, but whilst we're just waiting for David Campbell-Bannerman to connect. I mean, pretty shocking, that report, actually. Oh, absolutely. And the Prime Minister has uh, pledged to reduce the numbers of illegal immigrants coming into the country. Uh, he's done OK so far by reducing it by a third, but suggestions that it's going to go up again will uh, will not be popular with the public, to say the least. Uh, much more has to be done. I'm a supporter of the Rwanda policy. Uh, they have to get that working. It could disrupt the people smugglers' uh, uh, strategy. That's interesting. So you support so whether or not it's going to happen, <laughs> if it it did happen, you think that it would act as a deterrent? I think it could do, and I think we have to try it. I think it would say to people smugglers and to those that are paying £10,000 to people smugglers, if you come to Britain, there's no guarantee that you'll end up staying there. But surely that would only be the, a deterrent if everybody who comes across goes straight to Iran, as opposed to a few hundred, which is what the suggestion is. It, it has to be a good proportion. It has yeah. to be a decent number, without, uh, without a doubt. Fantastic. Simon, thank you so much indeed. We'll come back to you later in the show. That's Simon Danjo. Joining me now, though, is the former Conservative MEP, David Campbell Bannerman, uh, Conservative member of the European Parliament. David, a very good morning to you. Uh, I suppose we should say Happy New Year, but the news is not that happy on uh, issues regarding illegal migration and uh, legal indeed. Let, uh, let's just start with... Start with um, the illegal migration numbers. We've just had a report there suggesting that the numbers will get worse in 2024. Uh, the Prime Minister that you support told us he was going to stop the boats, David. When's that going to happen? Well, it's a major issue, Richard. You're right to raise it. Uh, I'm very concerned about it. it. This is why the Rwanda bill uh, is so important. And as you know, there's, there's huge goings on in the House of Commons about this. The right wing groups such as the ERG and the New Conservatives and others <coughs> are very concerned about it. And they're right to push for it. Because what we've got to see is a major disincentive. You've Simon and you just touched on that. We've got to have a disincentive, even... Blair recognised that, you know, the papers just released. He wanted to use the Isle of Mull or even the Falkland Islands. But what's critical is to put people off coming and to put uh, people smugglers off, actually, you know, their wicked trade of putting these lives at risk. But that only works, David, if it's a deterrent. I mean, Simon says, I think quite rightly, it's got to be a significant percentage, but that means tens of thousands of people coming. As I understand from the Rwanda policy, it's a few hundred. That's not a deterrent. That's, that's essentially, that's optionality to the, in the eyes of the people crossing the channel. Well, actually, I, I do think it's a deterrent if, if the message is real. I, as your programme has reported in the past, you know, they're, not, they, they're laughing at us at the moment. They're not taking it seriously. But I think when you get a, you know, a number of Rwanda flights going off and people sort of going over in boat and disappearing off to Rwanda, I think that is a big disincentive. They'll start saying, oh, is it worth it? Is it worth the risk, the cost? I mean, they're paying thousands to come across. You, so you say that, David, but OK, let's, 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 look at the, let's look at the attractiveness of trying to come here illegally. There's a story in today's Mail on Sunday which is, is both shocking and appalling in every sense of the word 
of a Sudanese gentleman who came to the UK illegally in 2005, somehow was given a right to stay here in 06, became a British citizen in 2015, went back to Sudan frequently between 16 and 17, when he became an ISIS-promoting Islamist extremist. Yeah. When he came back to the UK, the police found extreme material uh, on his mobile phone. In 18, the citizenship was revoked. He carried on going willy-nilly between Sudan and the United Kingdom, re-entered into the UK in 18. Here we are five yeah. years later, and a couple of weeks ago, special immigration commissioners who are paid to apply the law have said that he can stay here because of his human rights, even though he's been travelling willy-nilly between the two nations. What is going on? Well, I, frankly, Richard, I don't trust the, the Home Office. I don't think it's fit for purpose. I think there's a major reform needed. There's too much sympathy or empathy for uh, illegal immigrants in the Home Office. Um, look, it goes back to what I call a knot of human rights laws. Uh, it's not just the ECHR, it's uh, the Human Rights Act, which Blair brought in. Um, it's the uh, Refugee Convention that Suella Braverman rightly is. About. I think she's the only one I've heard talk about it, which, you know, make these people refugees when they're not refugees. They're economic migrants who want a better life, many of them. And we can't accept that. So we've got to sort the underlying issues. Even if Nigel Farage was Home Secretary, he'd have the same problems because the the country has signed up to too many international treaties that are no longer fit for purpose. Well, so, so you raised that point. So, David, would you leave the European Convention on Human Rights? I know I would. I know Nigel would. What about you, David? Yeah, I mean, my priority is the Human Rights Act, which, as I say, Tony Blair brought in, which requires our courts to take notice of the judgments of the ETHR. It was much looser before then. It was a kind of sort of... Uh, you know, so do you agree, David, we should just leave it, yes or no? Yes, I think we should. I think that should be our policy at the next election. And, 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 know, and talking of the next election, many... last question, yeah. David, the next election, is immigration going to be the number one issue on voters' minds, both lawful and unlawful, at the election, do you think? I think so, and cost of living. Uh, I think you're right earlier. It is immigration and cost of living, and uh, we've got to have a better answer. I accept that. Uh, David, thank you so much indeed for your thoughts. That's David Campbell Bannerman, who is a, uh, was a former Conservative member of the European Parliament. Well, coming up, loads more to get through before the top of the next hour. Unbelievably. I mean, we did Brexit to get rid of a whole load of daft EU laws, but only a few hundred by this government are going to be axed. I want thousands axed. All of that and much, much more to come. You're watching me on GB News here, Britain's news channel. GB News is Britain's news channel, and now you can support it. All you have to do is scan that QR code that's up on your screen right now, or you can go to gbnews.com forward slash support and become a GB News member. You'll have fantastic benefits. We're also going to organise special events where you as GB News members can meet the presenters, the on-screen faces. Scan the QR code or go to gbnews.com slash support. Thank you so much. Big news, big debate, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. Open your mouth. OK, here comes, a, here comes a train. Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? Whoa! Whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel.
What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. Wake up to the headlines with Headliners every morning at 5am. We treat you to the day's biggest stories before anyone else, seven days a week. You can catch up on everything you need to know before you've even had your kippers. Mmm. Headliners every morning at 5am, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Have a great Saturday night with me, Leo Curse, on this Saturday Night Showdown. It's a crazy world out there, so come and make fun of it with me, my panel of comedians, and a couple of people who actually know what they're talking about. This Saturday Night Showdown is your front row ticket to the clown show. Every Saturday, only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back, my friends. Now, loads of you getting in touch about the police story, the riots in Camberwell in London. And I tell you what, you are properly cross, fuming, just like me. Sue says, why can't we get the water cannons or the tear gas out? They do in Europe. Good point. Graham says, the police should be able to engage with baton control without the risk of being suspended. If people are rioting like this, then they're fair game to get hit wherever is required. Audrey says, I'm fuming too at these riots. Water cannons with coloured dye required to identify the thugs. Norman Brennan is on to something there. Absolutely. If he's still listening, he'll be delighted by that. Uh, just and on and on, the, uh, the list goes. People properly angry. I tell you what, the politicians are way, way out of touch with the feelings of millions of people up and down the country. That's why I spoke about it in my Sunday sermon. Now, those of us who back Brexit, of course, we want to do it properly. One of the Brexiteers, David Jones, MP uh, for Cluid, I think it is, he's written 10 Brexit New Year resolutions in the Mail on Sunday. I'll get to those in a minute, because I'm joined by Catherine McBride, who's a fellow at the Centre for Brexit Policy. She's down the line. Uh, Catherine, a very good morning to you on this New Year's Eve. So. Uh, David Jones says that we should have lots of New Year Brexit resolutions. My view is, well, why is it taking you so long? I mean, can we just... I know you've been very focused on EU red tape. We were promised a bill in the Parliament uh, in 2023 to get rid of, I think, some 4,000 laws. That was ditched. We're lucky if we get a few hundred. Uh, well, yes, but this evening, the... Um the supremacy of EU law is ending in the UK, and that is incredibly important. So for the first time in a generation, the UK statute book no longer recognises the supremacy of EU law or EU principles, and that means that whatever laws we do retain in the future, they'll be interpreted with a common law mindset, and that is incredibly important. And I would also stress that although we're only getting rid of 600 retained EU laws, which were mainly redundant, and there have been another 100 added to that. But the UK changed a lot of EU regulation the moment we left. And these were things that were changed by statutory instrument and very few people complained about. So we got rid of the three crop rule for farmers, uh, which was always crazy, never worked for the UK. We got rid of the double volume cap for the big city um, asset managers that was also crazy for the UK and was in intentionally developed by France to try and undermine the UK supremacy in asset management. But, so and Catherine, a lot of laws have changed. 
Okay, but, but I'm hearing, for example, in, in the fishing industry, I'm hearing that actually our own self-imposed gold-plated laws and regulations are getting even worse and that making costs go up and even harder for, for one of the great Brexit opportunities, British fishing. Well, I, I'm sure that's probably true if the fishing industry is telling you that. I haven't looked into that one. I mainly do sort of agriculture and financial services, which I know a bit about. But the fishing industry will change our relationship with Europe next year. They get to um, renegotiate, getting back more of the licenses, uh, getting um taking them off EU boats. Uh, right now, they did renegotiate a few months ago, and we got more fishing licenses of our own land, of our own water, but also from Norway and Iceland and Greenland. So but, and I guess there, there are some good things happening, but you're right, there, there are probably other things that are not I mean, one of the big things that I've always been saying, and I think that this government and this Chancellor and Prime Minister have done exactly the opposite, is take advantage of the tax freedoms to reduce oh. VAT, to reduce uh, tax on energy policy, to reduce corporation tax, and they've done exactly the opposite on all of this stuff. I 100% I agree with you. I must say, the, the only department that I think has really taken any advantage of Brexit has been what is now called the Business and Trade Department. Uh, they are responsible for getting rid of the retained EU laws and changing the supremacy to the UK legal system. But they've also signed all the trade deals. When you look at what the Treasury has done, it's ridiculous. The, one of the first things they should have done is get rid of some of the VAT regulations or VAT entirely and change it to a more sensible sales tax. Absolutely right. Um, um, to, to finish, Catherine, I have got some good news I read in the papers this morning. I was aware of it. In English sparkling wine has had some regulations on the packaging and the, uh, the bottling requirements lifted, I think, today. So that'll be good news. And we can also now produce a lower alcohol, lower alcohol piquette wine, if, uh, if you're familiar oh. with that. Yes, no, definitely. There's a lot of changes to the winemaking industry, which is a really big industry, or not a big, but it's growing. It's growing. And it's award-winning, and people don't even know it exists. But a lot of the time it was hampered by EU regulations, which was were designed to protect the EU wine. Absolutely. Industry. Catherine, well, that's some good news to celebrate the new year with. Thank you so yeah. much for all you do. Definitely. And there we are, the English wine business doing well and regulations going away. Coming up, so much more. Uh, and I'll be joined by Simon Danzik. But first of all, we've got to go to the news with Tatiana. Richard, thank you very much. This is the latest from the GB Newsroom. Look forward to 2024 with pride and optimism. That's the message from the Prime Minister as Britain prepares to celebrate the new year. Rishi Sunak promised a brighter future in his New Year's message with tax cuts and a reduction in national insurance. He described 2023 as a momentous year, which saw inflation halved and record investment in the NHS. That's despite junior doctors in England planning their longest walkout in NHS history next month. Boris Johnson's former chief adviser says Rishi Sunak tried to strike what he called a secret deal in a bid to win the next election. Dominic Cummings told the Sunday Times that he was prepared to help the Tories win if he was assured the most critical issues were prioritised. That reportedly includes nuclear weapons infrastructure, future pandemics and artificial intelligence. The proposal was apparently rejected by the Prime Minister. Number 10 did not deny the report, but says Mr Cummings was not offered a position. American XL bully dogs must be kept on lead in England and Wales under new rules that come into force today. They'll need to be muzzled in public and it's illegal to breed, sell or to abandon them. Owners are urged to apply for a certificate of exemption for current pets by the end of January before it becomes illegal to keep any unapproved XL bully dog. The ban follows a series of deadly attacks this year. 
And Eurostar services are back in service today, but the company's warning of further delays and busy stations. All Eurostar services between London and Paris came to a halt yesterday as water flooded a tunnel beneath the Thames. Many passengers were left facing expensive hotel bills as others desperately searched for alternative travel routes. Eurostar says at least one tunnel can now be used, but there are speed restrictions in place and stations are expected to be very busy. You can get more on all of those stories by visiting our website, gbnews.com. Thank you, Tatiana. Now, loads more coming up. I've got a question for you. Here we go. King Charles left Westminster Abbey after his coronation wearing his imperial state crown. How many diamonds do you think that crown contains? I'll give you the answer a bit later in the show. But first of all, we've got the weather with Craig. Good morning. Welcome to your latest GB News weather forecast. I'm Craig Snell. Well, as we go through New Year's Eve, for most of us, it's going to be a mixture of bright spells and scattered showers. So it's not quite the case for the far north of Scotland here. It's actually going to be quite a wet and windy end to 2023. But uh, elsewhere, there will be some sunshine, as I mentioned, but also a scattering of showers initially across the west, but they will spread their way eastwards as we go through the course of the day. Some of these will be quite heavy. Could even hear the odd rumble of thunder. Quite blustery too across the south coast and with winds coming in from the northwest a little bit of a cooler day compared to yesterday but temperatures still doing fairly reasonably could see highs reaching about 9 to 10 degrees across the south. Then as we head towards midnight, for most of us, it's going to continue with a risk of some showers. So have a rain jacket handy. For Scotland, it might well turn a little bit dry here as we go past midnight, but that may allow it to turn fairly chilly. Elsewhere, temperatures not falling much lower than about five to seven degrees in the southern half of the UK. So for New Year's Day itself, for the northern half of the UK, we continued that showery theme, a mixture of some bright spells and some showers. But for the southern half, actually, it will turn drier and brighter for a time. So a brief respite from the unsettled weather here. But uh, it's not going to last for too long, especially down towards the very far southwest of the UK. Some cloud and some rain will return later on in the day. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens with our team of dedicated journalists across the UK. We're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. 
Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. GB News is Britain's news channel, and now you can support it. All you have to do is scan that QR code that's up on your screen right now, or you can go to gbnews.com forward slash support and become a GB News member. You'll have fantastic benefits. We're also going to organise special events where you as GB News members can meet the presenters, the on-screen faces, scan the QR code or go to gbnews.com slash support. Thank you so much. Welcome back. The emails are pouring in and some are full of optimism. Here, John says, my New Year's resolution is to keep pounding GB News in my emails. They love to read them out and you feel connected and part of the GB family. And Pauline says, my New Year's resolution is to watch even more GB News. Fantastic, that is for sure. And spread the word. Tell your friends, your family, everybody else. Now, of course, we've got to look forward to what's going to happen in the economy. How's that going to impact our prospects, the amount of cash in our pocket at the end of each week. Well, I'm delighted to be joined down the line by an independent economist, Julian Jessup. He's a man who knows a two or thing. Julian, a very good morning. Thanks for being with us. So, uh, 2023, we sort of just escaped a recession by the skin of our teeth, I think it is, although there's a bit more data still to come out. The data seems to actually be getting worse not better, I think, contrary to what the Prime Minister thinks. Um, what are your thoughts about 2024, Julian? Do you share the Prime Minister's and the Chancellor's optimism? Well, I think it will be a, a happier New Year for, for most people. And I think the, the key here is that inflation is finally falling. In fact, I think it will continue to fall rather more quickly than the, the Bank of England in particular has been expecting. And that, that's clearly good news for all sorts of reasons. One is that the, the Bank of England itself will finally be able to take the, the foot off the brakes. In, in fact, I think it will start cutting rates early next year. Wow. Um, lower interest rates and lower inflation also give the Chancellor more wriggle room on, on taxes as well. So I think we'll get a, another spring budget that includes some fairly meaningful tax cuts this time around. Um, and I, I think that's sort of key to sentiment in the wider economy as well. I mean, people have been very worried, quite rightly, about the cost of living crisis. And while it's certainly not over, at least things are clearly now heading in the right direction. But, Julia, uh, how can we... I mean, the numbers have been getting worse. They, they downgraded quarter two, 2023. Uh, quarter three was, was, I think, minus 0.1. October was minus 0.3. We obviously wait what's happened in October and December, they could at best maybe flat. Here's my issue. I don't see how an economy can grow when you've got taxes at record high levels, when you've got government spending at record high levels along with the regulations <laughs> as well, when you've got mass low-skilled immigration, and when you've got the trillion, the multi-trillion cost of net zero. These appear to me to be huge burdens that weigh on any prospect of economic growth. Well, I think I share all of those concerns. And just sort of underlining the bad news first, um, it's true that we've avoided what economists call a, a technical recession, which is, you know, two, three month periods in a row where the economy has contracted. But it's actually only true of the headline numbers. If you look at, you know, income per head, if you adjust for the growing size of the population, then we are actually in a recession on that basis. Now, there were, there were a few signs in the last few a uh, few weeks of data that things might be a little bit better towards the end of 2023. But we're certainly starting from a very, very weak point. And uh, my optimism for 2024 needs to be put in context as well. I think the economy will grow maybe by a half or, or 1%. Um, but that's still pretty pathetic. Um, we're still in a position where the economy is, is a lot smaller than it would have been if it continued growing at the same rate it was, say, 10 or 20 years ago. So we do have big underlying problems in the economy. But the I think, tax burden is part of them. But I think that's the key point, Julian, to remind people. In the 1980s and 1990s, we were growing on average between 25 and 3.25% and and every single year. I mean, these are numbers 
that frankly most people can't even dream of now. We didn't have mass immigration then. You've, you've touched on a critical point. Per head, we're in a recession and people are getting worse off. And I don't think that's going to change. Well, I think if it is going to change, we need a fundamental shift in, in mindset. I think we need to sort of basically prioritise three things. One is boosting productivity in the economy. So, you know, everything that the government does, it should think about, will it make us more productive? Will it increase, increase output per hour? The second thing is we need to fix the obvious problems in, in, in public services, which includes, by the way, very low productivity in the public sector. But, you know, we need to make those far more modern and you know, deliver what customers want, not necessarily the people working in those services. And finally, we need to tackle the problem of um, what's called participation. Basically, not enough people are working. That includes a very large number of people who are uh, on disability benefits who probably could work. Um, but also people choosing to retire earlier than they need to because work simply doesn't pay because of high taxes in particular. So we've got some big fundamental problems there that need tax. And I think that's a critical point that you've just used. Those three words, make work pay, that's the fastest way to deal with a cost of living crisis. If you lift, for example, the income tax threshold significantly, which is, which is my preference, then you put me more money in people's pocket immediately to deal with that. Uh, just finally, Julian, to what extent have you looked at the, the, the state of the government's deficit, the annual uh, spending more than the receipts? Because by my calculations, that could be in, in the year to April 24, that could be about 150 billion quid. Uh, it's about 116 billion so far. I mean, these are massive numbers that are not sustainable in the medium term. Yeah, I mean, the public finances are, are certainly in a mess. The, the question is how to fix that. And I don't think you do that by raising taxes. Um, and that might give sort of a short term boost to the public finances. But what we ultimately need is stronger economic growth. And you have a combination of well-targeted tax cuts that, for example, as you say, make work pay. Uh, more people work, more people pay tax. Similarly, raising taxes on businesses doesn't actually help because it discourages investment. You know, other companies just shift their activities overseas. So uh, we need to get away from the idea that higher tax rates actually bring in higher tax revenues. That simply isn't the case. What we should be focusing on instead is, is growing the economy and well-targeted tax cuts may well be part of that. Fantastic. Uh, Julian, thank you so much indeed for your thoughts this New Year's Eve going into 2024. That's Julian Jessup. He is an independent economics expert. He's trying to be optimistic. He hopes that we might get a little bit of growth. But frankly, anything between 0 and 1 per cent, I mean, that's just piddling along. I don't call that growth. I call that feeble frankly. But anyway, let's turn to Simon Danzuk. Um, Simon, you heard there from, uh, f from Julian Jessup. Are you any more optimistic or are you concerned, as I am, about the economic prospects? I think we should be concerned. What we're going to see on the 6th of January, we have a cut in national insurance being applied that was announced uh, earlier this year in the autumn. And then the 6th of March, we have the budget. But my concern is that it's not radical enough. We're not seeing enough uh, radical change in our economy. So I agree with Julian Jessup, absolutely. Improve productivity, uh, reduce the s size of the state, uh, a number of things. Uh, deregulation, we need more deregulation. Great breaks of opportunity, of course. Absolutely. Scrap a whole bunch of daft Absolutely. EU laws. Yeah, and do more trade with uh, the Commonwealth, which is their uh, real opportunities. It's a third of the country. Uh, so there's a lot more we could do, but I suspect we're not going to see that. It's very cautious under Sunak and uh, Jeremy Hunt. Uh, so it's very too cautious. I think that's right. They are very cautious. And it's fascinating. You, you were a, a, a Labour MP for many years. And for you to be saying that, I think you're identifying the key concerns. Of course, it's actually the people on the lowest incomes, the working class and the red wall seats, who are struggling the most yeah. with this cost of living crisis, with taxes where, where they are. It feels to me that Westminster just doesn't quite get that or doesn't know how to deal with it. Absolutely, and I, I've always, I was always a traditional Labour MP, and by that I mean uh, tough on illegal immigration, tough on benefit cheats, uh, 
it was mentioned there, economic inactivity is far too high in this country. There's too many people of working age who are not working. So getting them back into employment is crucially important. And, and we'll address this issue in terms of labour shortages as well. So we need radical reform. And I have to say, Liz Truss had some of the right ideas. She didn't implement them well, as, <laughs> as we know. Uh, but she's got a growth commission, which is well worth looking at. She's announced since then. And that's worth looking at in terms of how we grow the economy. Some of the stuff that Julian's been talking about there. Absolutely right. So, um, just also, uh, we've had the, uh, the New Year's speeches from uh, Keir Starmer and Sunak. You're talking about them being cautious. What do you think to their New Year messages? Are they, are they two sides of the same coin? They're very similar, and what we've got is the Conservative Party and Labour sort of coalescing in the middle uh, on, on the moderate ground of politics, and I don't think that's what the public want. They want something much more uh, radical. But these statements for, for the new year from both Starmer and Sunak are very cautious. Let's have a better 2024. The people want a radically better 2024. I think people want some honesty and some realism about where we are and... If they're going to be optimistic, they've actually got to tell us what they're going to do to change things to get there, because warm words and waffle ain't going to cut it. No, that's right. The public are looking for some really strong leadership in the style of uh, Margaret Thatcher or Tony Blair, somebody who's going to be really radical and, and propose to change the country for the better. And, and that's not what's being said by either Sunak or Stormer at this stage. Uh, absolutely right. Well, we're going to end, uh, Simon. You've been uh, great this morning with a little bit of a uh, little bit of entertainment. I'm going to test you now right. uh, with your general knowledge. Obviously, one of the most important questions of the day is the Right Honourable Sir Jacob Rees-Mogg, pr uh, presenter. How many children does he have? Oh, he has quite a few, doesn't he? He has more <laughs> than me, in fact. It's seven, I will guess. Uh, right. A good effort. Right. Six is the answer. Right. Now. <laughs> Uh, of those six, right. how many forenames have they got ahead of this? <laughs> oh, goodness me, about five, I would think. Four. In total, I'm talking about the cumulative oh, number. For the, all the children. Oh, 23. Very, very good effort. 22 is the answer. Now, the next question, this is sort of New Year's Eve quiz, folks. Yeah. Um, which of these did Nigel Farage say to Coots used as evidence that he was not a fit person to hold an account in the documents that he has? Was it that he kept on making Euro withdrawals, that he retweeted a Ricky Gervais joke, <laughs> that he stole a pen from their central London branch, or that he'd only waste his money on beer and fags? <laughs> the Ricky Gervais joke, I'm guessing at, but... Uh, that is fan. spot on. You're very oh, good at this. I have to say, I'm very, very impressed. I didn't so, know we were going to be doing this. Ah, oh, but there you are. You see, you're spot on. Now, the question I posed to the audience earlier, King Charles mm. left the Abbey wearing the Imperial State Crown. How many diamonds does it contain? A, none. B, 868. Or C, 2,600... No, 2,868. B. B, you said 860. Yeah. Sorry, you missed it. You're way under. This is a proper crown. No nonsense. Wow. No cheapskates for this crown. 2,868 diamonds in that crown. I suspect Dawn Neeson, the next presenter, has got many, many of those uh, diamonds in one of her crowns. Who knows? What else have we got? Yes. Um, who left uh, UK football being paid 27 million a year to go to Saudi Arabia to be paid 173 million a year? I have absolutely. I do not know. You do not do about football. football. The answer to that is, of course, uh, Christian Ronaldo. Uh, one more for you. You'll know this one. Uh, who lost her job being paid over £5 million a year for revealing someone else's financial secrets? Oh, well, that's the uh, chairman of NatWest, isn't it, whose name escapes me. But I saw her in a, a Mayfair restaurant the other morning, actually. But, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wonder if she was paying the bill, whether well, she was feeling a bit down on her luck. Yeah, yeah. She also actually, I think, has had her name removed from a government report that was, I think, was going to go out under her name. So it has been a pretty significant... I suspect 2023 may well be... Uh, Dame Alison Rose's Anna Cerebulus. Uh, Simon, you've been fantastic. Thank you so much for uh, being with us this morning on uh, GB News on this show. There we are, lots of other questions. Some great questions in the mail on Sunday if you want a bit of New Year's Eve entertainment. But, of course, lots of entertainment still coming up in the show. Dawn, come on, how Hello. many diamonds have you got in your jewellery? I need to know. <laughs> Darling, just in my wedding ring alone, um, she says, lying very badly. <laughs> I think there's a, there's a chip in there, and it's probably glass knowing the husband. And then he goes, we've got a cracking show coming up. Excellent. Actually. We've got the first live fireworks of yes. 2024 coming up. 
from Australia. Good to be We've already done the New Zealand ones. Oh. Oh, oh have oh, you? I've, oh, I've, that, was, that was an hour ago. Was it? Yeah, I've blown your bubble. It. Oh, right, OK. <laughs> keep well, going, I'm, keep I'm going. going. Strike, then. I'm not doing it. I'm going to go and get more diamonds. Uh, no, OK, and we have got, we've got, we're going to uh, various pubs and clubs around the country, Ooh. seeing what the plans are, what people are doing. And obviously the hospitality industry has struggled a bit as well. So finding out what more can be done to help that industry, very important. Talking to the people that are going to be working very, very hard over the next 24 hours as well. Absolutely. Just finally, Dawn, did you see the... Uh, You're not the... going to ask me one of your questions. No, I'm not, actually. I'm going to be nicer than that. The, the social media reports of the, the rioting in Camberwell, South yes, London, I did, yesterday. Yeah. I spoke about that earlier. I have to say, the viewers and listeners are utterly fuming yeah. about the inability of the police to respond properly to it. Yeah. Comprehensively, it's it's it, it was it, the, the the scenes are absolutely shocking, and the thing is, I, I think the ordinary coppers on the beat do a very good job, but they're often thrown under the bus by the powers that be who won't support them. I mean, they had small batons against huge poles and sticks. Yeah. I mean, you know, if I was a frontline officer then you'd have been utterly terrified. You, know you what, just Richard, didn't have the equipment to deal with you know, it. No, absolutely. You know what, Richard? It's, it's very easy for us to sit and slate the police that they're not doing well, that burglars don't go, you know, go and get investigated. But they run to danger. They, they're protecting us, and they are so often neglected by the people running the police forces at the moment. Absolutely right. Dawn, you're going to have a great show. Thank you so much. Don't go anywhere, folks. Dawn Neeson will entertain you for the next few hours. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed being in the show. Coming up, lots, of course. Have a great new year. But first of all, it's the weather. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Good morning. Welcome to your latest GB News weather forecast. I'm Craig Snell. Well, as we go through New Year's Eve, for most of us, it's going to be a mixture of bright spells and scattered showers. So it's not quite the case for the far north of Scotland here. It's actually going to be quite a wet and windy end to 2023. But uh, elsewhere, there will be some sunshine, as I mentioned, but also a scattering of showers initially across the west, but they will spread their way eastwards as we go through the course of the day. Some of these will be quite heavy. Could even hear the odd rumble of thunder. Quite blustery too.